Cool. Um, all right, welcome to the first seminar series for this year. Um, today we have Hao Zhang talking about training large language models and specifically how to train them with um, comparing performance to ChatGPT, but with a lot smaller models, which I think is super cool. So how I think the stage is yours. OK, OK, yeah. Uh, thank you for the great introduction and uh, uh, thanks everyone for attending. And uh, my name is Hao. I'm currently an assistant professor at UC San Diego. I actually just joined uh, this July. Yeah, my first year as a faculty. And uh, it's super excited to be invited to the AX seminar at UCL. Uh, to share our recent development on open source large language models and also uh, evaluation and uh, systems behind these models. Yeah, it's pretty interesting because all this um, like technical stack were developed in the past six months. It's very exciting to see how fast the uh, large language models, especially in open source, evolve. Um, yeah, before I dive into uh, because I'm actually I have a joint background in machine learning systems, so this seminar will also be um, like a joint introduction of some machine learning stuff and also some system stuff. So before I dive into the hardcore uh, distributed system details, I'd like to spend the, uh, the first few minutes to share our uh, very, very interesting journey in the past six months in developing uh, the so-called model Wikuna and uh, the evaluation tool Chapel Arena. Yeah, let's get started. Uh, feel free to uh, post any question. So the story begins, of course, um, since Meta made their Lava models open source this March. And uh, since uh, this release, the open source large language model development become very, very active. And we can almost observe um, daily updates on like a new development on Lama. And out of curiosity, uh, we also requested access to the Lama weights and started playing with this model. Um, as if you have ever played it, you probably want to know that uh, the original Llama models were just very, very plain language models, which means that uh, they seem strong in many, many um, LLM benchmarks. But uh, uh, it turns out not, not, not to be very useful. For example, uh, they cannot even uh, correctly follow human instructions. Um, and meanwhile, we discovered a very, very nice website uh, called ShareGPT. And actually, this website is still live today. And uh, this is an online website where people install a Chrome extension in their ChatGPT window, browser window, and uh, start sharing their favorite conversations with ChatGPT online. And actually, this one was developed by, I think, from a developer from UK. UK yeah. And uh, we started uh, thinking about why don't we just use this shared GPT data to find tune Llama. Uh, so we just um, like immediately implement a very, very simple crawler and crawl all the data in shared GPT this March. And uh, uh, here's the interesting part. So when we put things together, uh, we interesting, uh, some interesting things really happen. Um, so basically we got a Wikuna model. Uh, the really interesting part about Wikuna model is that uh, after we obtain the model, we really don't know whether this model is good or not. Uh, it's a random product of a side project. So we just deploy the Wikuna and let many users try our models. And uh, we find a very, very surprising phenomenon. So we find that on one hand, Wikuna is strongly preferred over its base models, Llama, by most of our users. Uh, so basically we deploy this model in many, many users, like students and faculty members in different universities like Berkeley, CMU, UCSD. And um, a lot of our users really think that uh, this model is good. And it's way good, way, way better than uh, the Llama model. And a lot of users are even surprised that uh, uh, this model talked in a way that is so similar to OpenAI's ChatGPT. But on the other hand, uh, when we benchmark the early versions of Wikuna, we train, we found that they do not actually improve. Or sometimes we found that they, they even decrease those commonly used NLP benchmarking metrics. So this slide shows an example uh, where a prompt question is answered by two chatbot assistants in a marketing dialogue situation. Um, despite that both models are actually giving the right answers, uh, the assistant B, which is the one on the right, uh, its answer is often preferred by users because, uh, uh, because of its stronger instruction following ability 
and also more detailed explanation. Uh, it's answering style and some other language um, nuances. And this phenomenon suggests that uh, there's a fundamental discrepancy between user perceptions of the useful list of chapels and the criteria adopted by conventional benchmarks. OK. Um, and besides this example, I'm not, next I'm going to show a few other examples. I will let you uh, feel the, uh, the, the problem in actually language model evaluation. Yeah, how about this example? This is the second example where uh, a prompt is given, uh, which is which asks chatbots to develop a Python program that reads all the text files under a directory and returns the top five words with the most number of occurrence. Right, and the given this problem, um, apparently we can ask two language models to immediately write the answers. But here is a question. Which one is better? Right, because uh, this is definitely um, uh, not trivial because this is uh, related with programming. I don't think a lot of people who do not know programming can actually read this answer, right? Which means that uh, uh, we want to evaluate the two chatbots. We want to compare them. It's not trivial because chatbot is so versatile that it can touch in, uh, it can touch so many tasks. It's very hard to use an existing benchmark to tell which chatbot is better. One more. So here. I'm giving the third example where a question about the photosynthesis is asked. And uh, apparently we can also ask two chatbots to immediately get a general answer. But the question here is uh, how can we evaluate the answers? And uh, evaluating this answer probably require another different uh, like set of knowledge on biology, on uh, other part of the science. And uh, if you are not an expert, uh, it's probably very hard to figure out the uh, those nuances here. So in summary, there are two points I want to make. Uh, after we deployed with Kuna, we found that the language model evaluation is really, really difficult. So why it is difficult? There are two, um, two reasons. One is, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, the benchmarks cannot tell human preference, right? Because the existing benchmarks are often designed for a specific, uh, for example, task that uh, usually measure the accuracy or some other sort of a uh, uh, metric. But, uh, uh, it really cannot tell whether a human would prefer an answer or not, even if both answers are correct. The second is uh, second point I want to make is, uh, um, of course, it's very expensive to evaluate because uh, uh, chatbots and all those language models are so versatile and they can perform on so many tasks. Uh, we need to hire many, many experts from different areas to read chatbots. OK, um, and given that, um, oh, here I want to introduce our first uh, set of new evaluation. That is, uh, uh, in order to evaluate all these kind of uh, uh, tasks uh, and their performance on different task, uh, tasks, so how can we avoid using human to, uh, to to evaluate this performance? So the first idea is, what if we use the strongest ARM as a judge? Right? What if we tell, we, we put these two answers into um, uh, GPT-4 and see how GPT-4 says about these uh, answers? Uh, because GPT, like like the intuition here is because GPT-4 was trained on almost all the uh, available data that the human has ever generated on internet. It should have also, uh, and it is pretty strong on a lot of different metrics. So it should also have the ability to tell if, uh, like a, uh, given a question, if the two weaker chatbots can actually generate the right answer. So here is an example. Uh, we did some sort of prompt engineering uh, on GPT-4 and uh, we basically feed uh, the question plus the two answers uh, into GPT-4 and with some other prompt template. And we ask GPT-4 to rate uh, which one is better. And uh, if you just spend uh, 20, uh, 20 seconds looking at the output of GPT-4, you'll see it actually, uh, to some extent, it can read a lot of uh, its answers very fast than human, much faster than human, and can give a reasonable explanation which one is better and which one is not, right? So this is basically a first set of like a uh, automatic evaluation we propose to evaluate this uh, with Kuna model. And also, uh, since we adopted this evaluation, uh, there, ha there has been a surge of interest in using the strongest large language model such as GPT-4. And later, I think people also extrapolate this in, into another model called Anthropic, uh, uh, trained by another company. Uh, uh, and they use this stronger models as a judge, and they try to use the judge to judge the answers uh, like in, in replacement of human effort. 
And same thing here, uh, we can also ask GP4 to uh, evaluate the answers to a question that related with the photosynthesis. And, uh, and apparently GPT-4 is very capable of doing that as well. Uh, at least much more capable than, than, than most of the, our humans. OK, so uh, this this part, uh, uh, I basically proposed uh, a new evaluation that uh, is based on GPT-4. Um, but uh, but uh, uh, but there's a deeper question here. So uh, can GPT-4 actually tell the human preference? Because of GPT-4, at least it's, uh, it's not human, right? We still need, a, need to ask a human to rate like which response is better or which response not. For example, uh, in the previous example I gave, both answers are correct. Um, so how can we know? Uh, each answer will be more preferred uh, by a human. So the question, the, the central question here is uh, how to evaluate human preferences. And I think this, uh, the answer to this question is also quite obvious. So in order to evaluate human preferences, I think the gold standard to tell the human preferences is of course you ask, you directly ask human to reach apples. But as I mentioned um, before, uh, whenever we want to uh, start doing some human evaluation, we face an efficiency issue that is a, uh, uh, how can we scale this up? Because uh, uh, it's really a uh, like a labor intensive process and also sometimes even uh, very, very cost, uh, uh, like cost sensitive to ask human to read this level. Okay, so so here's the idea. Uh, the intuition is because the chatbot answers uh, will, will be inter interpreted by humans, so it makes sense for human to, to be the you know ultimate evaluators. And uh, uh, so ideally, when we want to deploy this kind of evaluation, we want to uh, give the LM a question and the general answers, and we want to we want to human to rank all this LMs on, on the answers given a fixed question. Uh, however, when you start ranking, uh, uh, for example, if you have n LMs, so the task becomes that you need to rank n choices, and it turns out rank n choices and given uh, each answer uh, exact rank. Uh, like a number for between one to n, it's actually very hard. So instead of doing that, uh, we can try to simplify this problem a little bit. Like instead of ranking all these n answers, we can probably just ask a uh, human to pick the best of n, right? Because picking a best of n is definitely better than ranking all n answers. But still, uh, picking the best of n is still very hard because at least you need to ask a human to read all the n answers and then remember them and try to you know figure out the best one. So we can even reduce this problem into another form that is uh, uh, it's, it's even easier to pick the best of two, right? So actually there's a book uh, telling <laughs> about all this kind of like a human evaluation phenomenon and why we should we um, like, uh, ask human to do, uh, pick the best of two instead of like, ranking and choices. Um, yeah, so basically based on this kind of intuition, we developed a, um, a methodology that is we can actually present to a human two answers from two chatbots and we try to let, uh, let, let the human to you know pick the best answer between the two LMs. And does this remind you of something? Um, I think so, right? Um, so basically this is uh, something uh, very similar to uh, the football games, right? Soccer games and uh, uh, this is actually something called a uh, tournament. So basically in a tournament, for each question, we compare each pair of the arms. And I think this relate uh, many, many um, people in Britain to uh, the favorite game of the world, that is uh, uh, football. Yeah, because basically in this kind of football games, we always let two teams to compete, right? And we try to uh, count uh, who, like which team wins and which team lose, loses. And we try to uh, com uh, accumulate the points for them. And we try to, based on the points, um, like run, run each team and eventually we will figure out uh, the champion, right? And um, and at that point, we definitely want to mimic this process because this is uh, very, very natural like on how human, uh, in the human world, how people rank like different teams, different persons, different players, uh, right? Um, but the problem still exists. What is the problem? It's very hard to scale because the, if you run this kind of tournament, uh, you still need to ask each two LMs to compete, but uh, uh, the number of LMs, especially the number of open source LMs in the world, is much more than the number of like football teams, right? In UK, um, so which means that if you want to run this kind of tournament among all open source LMs, then you have to spend a lot of resources, like 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 each of the 
pair um, of the of the ARMs to compete every day, right? This apparently is very hard to scale because uh, the complexity is uh, exponential. Yeah. So what is a better solution on this? Yeah. Uh, I think there does there does exist a, a much better solution, um, which is uh, instead of uh, uh, running running this kind of tournament, which is very expensive, we can actually do uh, adopt another rating system. So consider how like uh, consider another uh, rating system where uh, we still let the players to um, like to play with each other, but we can actually uh, use a system called a, um, ELO ratings to actually like given that the, uh, even if like uh, the two players should never played against each other uh, based on their historical plays with uh, like a, like they have been played with others um, and there's a the hope that we can use this historical play to calculate the, the ELO rankings and actually this ELO ranking is a, a very very classical concept of ranking uh, players uh, like a rank, ranking uh, like a so basically ranking in this kind of competitive games, uh, for example, in Go, in tennis, and also in the most recent, uh, I think, the mobile games like uh, League, League of Legends, people use this ELO rankings to develop a very sophisticated ranking system. And uh, as long as you continue playing, and as long as we randomly match two players and generating these game results, we can actually, based on these game results, to um, like calculate a ELO score. And that's ELO score, well, basically, uh, give you a very, very uh, good like a sense of how this player would rank in among all those players by looking by comparing their ELO score. So uh, given this insight, we basically started adopting a ELO system to um, to rank all these LMs because uh, by adopting this, we don't have to like let any random two LMs to compete, right? We just need to uh, randomly sample matches and we can eventually uh, use a very few number of matches to get its ELO score. Yeah. So what, what do we do on this? So basically, um, uh, basically we need to, we, we develop an evaluation platform called Chapel Arena, and this is a benchmarking platform for ARMs that features um, anomalous randomized battles in a cross-source manner. So basically we use this platform um, to connect uh, human votes. Um, so basically, uh, uh, apparently, this is not easy because uh, it's, very, it's not a cheap and easy process to connect this kind of human votes. Uh, as you may know, like ARM companies like uh, OpenAI and Anthropic paid millions of dollars to hire people to generate those labels. And um, that's why, um, you know, that's where the Shadow Arena project comes from this. Uh, it's essentially a, a slightly gamified data connection UI. So as this slide shows, uh, this UI panel has two sides. So each side corresponds to a chatbot, but uh, with their names hidden. And at the bottom, um, you can see uh, in, an input box where users tap, uh, tap a prompt. Then the two chatbots will provide a response at the same time. So users will be asked to read the response and, uh, uh, and then ask to read them. And there are a few buttons below to give the rates. So, um, so here we are given four choices. A is better, B is better, tie. Uh, or both are both are bad. So the interesting part uh, of this chapel arena is that we slightly gamify that so that uh, um, if you don't click uh, the rate, you will not see the lanes of the model. Only by click uh, clicking on one of the rate among these four, uh, that, that is uh, one of the buttons in, uh, among the four, we will like reveal the names. I think because most of the, the our players, like most of our users on this website, are are really curious to know. Uh, exactly like which model gives uh, this answer, the left answer or right answer. So we kind of like uh, incentive, uh, like give, give them an incentive, um, incentive to kind of like, uh, you know, cast their votes to us. Yep. And by running this chapel arena uh, for almost like a, a few months, and uh, every time we random sample to models and put them side by side and ask human to vote, we basically um, uh, can get this. That is, we served like 20 plus models in this chat arena project and start connecting a lot of user votes to run different chat assistants. And uh, at the left side, you can see, uh, after we connect a substantial number of votes, we basically can draw this heat map. And in this heat map, you can see uh, exactly the win rate between the two chat votes that we serve, right? Uh, the win rate means that uh, uh, like uh, on, uh, on the votes that were connected between these two chat votes, which one wins? 
uh, like how many uh, like uh, votes are uh, voted that uh, toward uh, like for example GPT-4 with over another model or GPT-4 uh, like model A with over model B. So uh, after we connect a substantial amount of these votes, we can use these votes to calculate the yellow rankings of these chatbots, uh, which will result in the leaderboard on the right. Right. This is so similar to the tennis games and uh, any other sport games where people use either ratings to rank players. And as you can see, the results is definitely not very surprising. Uh, GPT-4 uh, still champions the leaderboard, but uh, uh, other closed source models like uh, Anthropic Cloud um, is also very good. Yeah. And um, it turns out that the Kuna, the Kuna model and the Chapel Arena uh, gets a lot of uh, uh, attention. So, so first, after we're running this chatbot for uh, six months since this March, um, we, our project which supports this um, Chapel Arena actually gets a lot of attention. Uh, this project is called uh, uh, Fast Chat, and uh, uh, basically in six months we we kind of uh, accumulated almost um, 27 k starts on GitHub for this project. Yeah, a lot of attention, and also uh, this is the traffic map of um, how many like uh, uh, chat sessions we received in our chat bar website. As you can see, uh, we basically receive a uh, very high traffic every day, especially in the early uh, like first two months of uh, running chat bar arena. And uh, we also publish leaderboard regularly, um, for example, every few weeks, and we try to update the, the community which chapel is better, because uh, especially in, in, I think in May, in this May and in this June, people are really interested in to develop new chatbots based on Llama, and uh, we kind of like put them into evaluation and update people like what, what is the status of the latest model. And uh, I think uh, because of our uh, ranking system and because of our uh, Wakuna model, we do create a, a few impacts. Um, I think in this May, there's a document uh, which is uh, which becomes very, very popular in Twitter and also in Silicon Valley, which is a uh, recent by a commenter saying that Google, uh, we, we have no mode and neither does OpenAI. Um, and uh, this is largely because that uh, because of the leaderboard, because uh, you can say uh, some open source model is so close to um, closed source models. Um, and uh, I think people are starting uh, gaining confidence on open source models. Yeah. OK, uh, well, if you are interested, I can actually talk about the, uh, this uh, process of building with Kuna evaluation uh, um, a full day. But uh, now, uh, into this talk, I want to slightly move the focus now uh, on more hardcore system story behind this thing. OK. Um, so, uh, so let's start with some uh, with a, a different topic. So uh, the backend system and the deployment of Chatbot Arena. So in order to connect enough users' voting data, we have to serve all these models. Like I mentioned, uh, I think up to today we are serving 25 LMs um, on the Chatbot Arena project, and we basically need to simultaneously serve these 25 models uh, in a Chatbot Arena website so people come and uh, give in their votes. And also we need to make sure that all these models are served. Uh, with high throughput and low latency, because uh, if uh, one chatbot responds too slowly, I think people will just walk away, right? Um, but as a very, very small academic group, we need to not get a lot of uh, uh, compute. So basically, uh, uh, in our setup, uh, uh, we just have uh, um, about a, a, a dozen of a dozen of GPUs. Uh, for example, I, I think at the peak time, we basically have 20, uh, 20 uh, A100 with the issue with a uh, 40 gig memory, but sometimes we also need to uh, move this GPUs for some other projects. So basically, we, we need to mobile, mobilize all these 20 GPUs to serve like uh, more than 25 plus um, LMs, which are substantial. Um, and also, uh, as you can see from the traffic map, we receive uh, quite a lot of traffic every day. Uh, a lot of people start chatting with these shadows we serve, and um, in average, we receive a uh, 40K uh, chat sessions per day, uh, and at the peak time, we sometimes can even, uh, the, the, the traffic spec can go to, for example, 70K, yeah. So uh, the reason I mentioned this is there is a substantial system be, uh, behind this. So um, this actually forms our main use case. So uh, we are providing this public inference service. We want to connect the both to rank our models. 
but uh, we are university with only uh, tens of GPUs. And this drives us to think really hard about uh, the system problem. So how to uh, efficiently perform inference and serving for this kind of like auto regressive RMs. Yeah, that will be the next uh, major topic I'm, I want to talk uh, in this um, presentation. So uh, let's start with the first problem. So in which I will cover our solution called uh, page attention. And this page attention is uh, actually a, a newly accepted paper to this year's system top conference called uh, SOSP. Yeah, uh, you are welcome to check this paper with more details. OK, and uh, yeah. Now let's get started with page attention. So to understand the problem, let's look into uh, the inference process of large language models. So uh, because we have to understand the computational process in order to figure out how to serve it. So, so first, uh, the user provides a prompt um, consisting of multiple tokens. So in this example, the prompt is uh, artificial intelligence is. And the prompt goes through the model uh, and then we get the next token uh, to the prompt. Right, and this is basically uh, one inference step uh, of, of this RMs. And uh, in the next step, uh, uh, we basically feed this new token back to the model and get a second output, which is the future, right? And uh, this process is repeated um, until the sequence either reaches is a predefined maximum length or uh, generate a certain token called, uh, like for example, EOS, which means, uh, which stands for end of sequence. OK, so uh, in the inference process, LMS have a unique component, uh, which is often called a um, TV catch in the uh, machine learning literature. OK, um, and in processing a new token, the model actually needs not only the representation of the current token, but also the representation of all the previous tokens. So these states of previous tokens should be kept in memory, and uh, this is called the key cache, as you can see from these two uh, red boxes. So when a new token, in this example, uh, the token Z is generated, uh, besides the token itself, uh, it corresponded, its corresponding key caches also need to be kept and appended to the key cache memory space. So to recap a little bit this uh, entire process of, of like auto regressive algorithm generation of KV cache. So basically, um, KV cache is a memory space to store those intermediate vector representation of tokens. While the name is probably a little bit misleading to someone uh, like a, a researcher with a system background, so, but you can think of the, uh, this KV cache as a working set uh, for a sequence rather than a cache because uh, uh, the model uses every previous token uh, state because you, the model basically will use every previous token state to generate the next token. And importantly, um, the size of KV cache dynamically grows as new tokens are appended, and it also shrinks as the tokens are deleted once the sequence finishes with, uh, for example, an EOS. So, okay, uh, with that, we can just put the KV cache in memory and uh, we are good. So why do we care about this KV cache and why is this, is this related with um, uh, all this kind of service stuff, this performance stuff? So basically this, this will be the most important slide of this talk. Yeah, let, let me go through the reason why. So what if I tell you that uh, um, efficient management of KV cache in memory can actually greatly improve the ARM serving throughput? Let me try to explain the key insight here. So, uh, let's say we run a 13 billion um, LLM, like we could, not, uh, we could not 13 billion or say Lama 13 billion, a very, very popular LLM on a, uh, NVIDIA A100 with a 40 gig of GPU memory. So the model parameters takes roughly 26 uh, gigabyte of memory because each parameter is a FP16 uh, float. And, uh, <coughs> and in addition, um, a small fraction of memory is used for workspace. And the rest of memory can be used for KV cache, which is denoted as a pink color here, right? Roughly like a, a 13 gigabyte of memory can be used for storing KV cache. And um, we can try to have a curve plot where uh, in this curve, curve plot, I will have the X axis as the number of requests that uh, can run in parallel in the GPU. And the Y axis reflects its memory usage. So this memory usage definitely will be capped by 
um, the memory capacity of the GPU. So basically on, on this setup is 40 giga, as I mentioned. So a key finding here is um, as we put more requests in, in a parallel batch, so existing systems use KV cache in very, very inefficiently, and it will quickly um, grow the memory used to store KV cache, and it will quickly hit the GPU memory cap. And uh, hence, it will significantly limit the number of requests that can be batched together. Uh, but in contrast, if we can have a solution to manage KV cache more efficiently, we can basically flatten this orange curve a little bit into this blue curve, right? And thereby we can allow more large batch, batch sets, allow a much larger batch size with the same amount of memory, right? So in the uh, or in the in the orange curve, we can only support a batch size of eight, but in by, by flattening it a little bit, we can actually uh, support a um, batch size of forty. Yeah, it's about five times larger. Okay, so why this is important? Uh, let me explain. So basically, this increased byte size can directly translate into increased throughput. So if we draw another plot below to illustrate the relation between batch size and throughput, we can see that uh, as we increase the batch size process in parallel, before the GPU reaches its compute roofline, we can almost observe a linear increase in throughput, right? Basically, we project the two curves to another plot where the where we characterize the relation between throughput and batch size. As you can see, as long as we can increase the batch size, we are we can almost observe a linear increase on the throughput. So, uh, I think you got the intuition. Um, now let's try to answer a deeper question. So. What are the memory inefficiencies, inefficiencies in the previous systems? So why basically in the previous plot, uh, the previous systems uh, will, uh, will, be, will perform like that orange curve? So uh, this is a snapshot of the KV catch when using a previous system where uh, we find three types of memory wastes. So the first is reservation, which means that the, the slots that are not used at this moment but will be used for the sequence in the future. So here, the three um, three slots in the middle are reserved um, because they don't store any token at the current step. But uh, we believe that it will be used to store upper tokens in the subsequent steps because of the the autoregressive nature of generating tokens in IIL. So the second is a uh, internal fragmentation, which means the slots allocated for the sequence but never used. This happens because uh, the output length of the sequence uh, is not long a priori, right? Because we don't know when the ARM will stop for a particular request. And um, finally, uh, external fragmentation happens because uh, different requests A and B may have different uh, sequence lenses. So the memory width is actually significant. So in our profile data with the different memory management schemes, we observe that only 20 to 30 percent of the KV cache is actually utilized to store the token states, and the rest of the space were just wasted. So, in contrast, uh, in our proposed solution, which I will cover later, by optimizing the memory management, we can actually achieve over 96 percent average utilization of the KV cache, which is several times larger, higher than the existing system. And as I said, because uh, we have less fragmentation. So we use memory more efficiently. Because we use memory more efficiently, we can fit more requests in a batch. And because we can fit more, more requests in a batch, we will have better throughput. OK, now we understand the problem. So what is the secret sauce here? So uh, this is actually a very, very old problem, right? If you have ever studied uh, like operating system in, uh, in, like in computer science. So uh, the way we solve this problem uh, is to employ the old idea of virtual memory and paging in operating systems. So as we know, uh, the operating system that we are currently running uh, uses a paging to reduce the fragmentation in the physical memory space and uses the virtual memory for efficient space multiplexing between processes. And what we do is basically the same. Uh, it uses a similar kind of idea to resolve the fragmentation in the KV cache and enable efficient space sharing between requests. So this is enabled by our new technique called page attention, 
Yeah, let me delve into it a little bit. So to begin with, uh, we partition the KVK into an array of token blocks. A token block is a fixed size trunk of memory that can store token states from left to right. So in this particular example, uh, the block size is four, um, which means that we can store four tokens in a, in a block. Uh, so to clarify a little bit, the tokens here are not those strings. Um, they are token states, uh, the vector representations of the tokens in a sequence. So basically, each stored well, each, each, each stored in the block will basically store a, a, a vector. So for example, in the Llama 13, uh, 13 billion model, each token state should consume about one megabyte of memory, and it becomes larger when the model is, is larger. So on top of this, um, we can introduce the page attention, our new implementation of the attention mechanism. And we find that uh, the fundamental limitation of the previous system is that they require all KV states for a sequence to be stored in a continuous memory space. And this is the convention in typical like DNN workloads where the input and output space are static, uh, which are taken back granted in deep learning libraries like uh, the one we use very commonly like TensorFlow and PyTorch. However, it turns out to be highly inefficient for M inference, where the sequence lenses are highly dynamic and unknown at generation. So page attention directly addresses this limitation. So with this page attention, the KV states can be stored in land contigu contiguous blocks located in arbitrary positions in the KV cache. So basically, we, we, we virtualize the KV cache uh, to logical and physical token blocks. Uh, let's see how it works uh, with an example request A. So, and this request comes with a prompt. Alan Turing is a computer scientist. And in this logical view, uh, the tokens are stored in consecutive blocks and their orders is preserved. Uh, but in the physical view, uh, on the other hand, uh, the tokens in the same sequence may not be stored in adjacent blocks and the order between the blocks can be very arbitrary. And the mapping, um, and the, the mapping behind the logical blocks and the field of blocks is stored in a very, very lightweight block table, which is shown in the middle of the slide. For example, uh, in this slide, you can see uh, the logical block zero is mapped to the physical block seven, and the logical block one is mapped to the physical block one, and uh, the logical block is continuous, but the physical block is not. So let's continue this example. Uh, let's say uh, the model has generated the next token end. So the new token is uh, first appended to the last logical block, which is the logical block one on the left. And using the block table, we also append the new token to the corresponding physical block. Uh, this is where the true memory writing happens, right? We basically write the KV state of the new world end on the third slot of physical block one. And the same um, for the next generated token, which is a mathematician. Okay, we do the same thing. And finally, uh, if the last logical block is full, then we allocate the new physical block and store the token in the first slot of the new block, block five on the right. Uh, note here, the block five is allocated only on demand. So why is this important? Because if, uh, by, by allocating it only on demand, we eliminate a large portion of reserve memory. That is, we don't have a reserve for like a, uh, before this token is generated. And uh, uh, without this reservation, we can actually, actually allocate that part uh, if there's more requests coming into our systems. Yeah, this, basically this block file is allocated on demand. So this is basically how we manage the KVK. And so far we have covered how it works for a single request, a single sequence. But you can imagine like a, how it's going, going to work for multiple requests processed at the same time. It is just like the operating system virtual memory for processes. And we allocate the different token blocks for different requests. So in this example, there are two requests. One is on the left and the other is on the right. And they will be written uh, into different uh, logical blocks, and uh, those logical blocks will be mapped to the physical blocks in real memory. So let's quickly analyze the memory efficiency of, um, uh, of this idea. So first, uh, we have a very minimal internal fragmentation. 
This is because the internal fermentation only happens at the last block of a sequence. And this means that the number of the uh, whiskey tokens per sequence is bounded by the block size. Here, the block size is four. And in practice, the block size is much smaller than the sequence length. And second, uh, we also do not have any external fermentation because all blocks have the equal size, right? Not all the sequence, like, um, regardless of the how long they actually are, they basically work on the same block size. And third, uh, we do not reserve memory. Like I already emphasized, so a new block is only allocated on demand when the previous block is uh, exhausted. So putting this together, uh, we can basically achieve a very, very high utilization of Kiwi Cache, and uh, we actually profile a little bit. Uh, it's, it's over 96% on average, very, very little waste. So another advantage uh, of this dynamic block mapping and this page attention is that uh, it enables some sort of sharing. So for example, uh, if you have ever used the uh, like a LM based copilot frequently, um, you, you are probably familiar with this pattern that is uh, uh, called the parallel sampling. Uh, in this parallel sampling, a uh, user gives a prompt and uh, the model is asked to generate multiple outputs from the same prompt. And then the uh, the same the same the, a set of results are returned to user and uh, uh, let the user to decide uh, let the user decide which one they want. So in such a case, uh, the computation and the memory for the prompt can be saved for sharing because uh, they are exactly the same among different uh, like generated gener generated results. So uh, the proposed technical page attention actually can very naturally support this using the block tables. So when sequence A and B have the same prompt, uh, page attention keeps only one copy of it in the QB cache by mapping the logical block of A and B to the same physical block. And in addition, uh, it keeps track of the reference counts of the physical blocks. So what happens in the next step? So A and B will generate different output tokens from the prompt. And now A and B cannot share the last token block. So basically, this page attention will handle this using a copy on write mechanism. And meanwhile, uh, it basically will copy uh, the last token block, which is cannot be shared to a new space, and it will decrease the reference count from two to one. Yeah, like this. And, uh, and starting from here, the two sequences, because they are generating different contents, they will use different blocks, but at least the first block will be shared across the sequences, hence it will save a lot of memory. Yeah, then we can process A and B just like before, uh, like, like if they were a single sequence. While keeping most of the prompt tokens shared between the two. So now let's look at a more complete, uh, complicated case, uh, beam search. So beam search is a very popular uh, decoding algorithm in LP to find the most likely sequence among many possible candidates. Um, it's very similar to parallel sampling in the sense that the, the prompt is shared um, between different beams. Here I show three beams. So however, in beam search, um, the beams can dynamically join to other beams in every step. So in such a case, uh, some output tokens can be shared between the beams. For example, in this slide, I show that the famous computer scientist who will be shared between beam zero and one, but not in the beam two. So what does this token, uh, what does this pattern remind you um, of, uh, re remind you of in the OS virtual memory? It's very similar uh, to a process tree where you have, you can fork or kill the process depending on your runtime results, right? And then you can, uh, we can efficiently support the complex sharing pattern in beam search uh, by leveraging block mapping and copy on write mechanism. Um, like we can just uh, look at the beams and decide when we should copy and write and when should we decrease reference count as we did for the you know, parallel sampling example. And there are more interesting use cases in ELM inference, like a sharing prefix, uh, but I will skip for now. Yeah. Uh, the point I want to make is uh, uh, with this page attention, uh, we can actually uh, apply this uh, page, atten page attention and memory management mechanism to a lot of uh, um, uh, opportunities like a, uh, different sharing opportunities, uh, different decoding algorithms to save the memory, so so we can improve the throughput much much more. 
So we basically implement the special attention as a system called VLM. Um, and this VLM is an end-to-end -end serving system that includes front end and, and the distributed model executor and the scheduler. And most basically, this VLM can be thought as an inference engine uh, with a few custom CUDA ops. And uh, we basically use some uh, projects in the ecosystem for distributed execution, uh, as you can see from this architecture diagram. And uh, the source code of this VLM is publicly available. And uh, I think since we release uh, this VLM and we use this VLM to um, power up the serving in the chapel arena, I introduced in the first part of my talk, um, we got a lot of attention in open source. So, uh, for example, the machine learning open source community Hugging Face, they immediately op adopted the VLM after we released this technique. And, uh, uh, and also, a lot of people are looking at our code and try to contribute the models, more models or improvements. And um, yeah, and basically, as you can see from this start green curve, where I'm now, it's basically the number one serving system, open source serving system in the community. And if you are up to serving any model, uh, like um, like we call now, like uh, all those Lama derived models, consider using this. Now let's talk about the, a little bit on the evaluation part. So. Uh, how does VLM perform in uh, like in reality, like in uh, in real setups? So the metric we will use is the serving throughput, and uh, the way we measure it is to find the maximum request rate that the system can serve without exploding the queue, queuing latency. So uh, for generating the request trace, we basically use two different data sets. Uh, one is the shared GPT data I, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, which is used to treat Wipuna. And the other is the Alpaca data set used to train another model called Alpaca. Uh, Alpaca is another open source LM released by Stanford. And as you can see um, on both figures, where the Y axis is the normalized latency, uh, which is the main of every request end to end latency divided by its output length. And the VLM, which is the blue curve, retains much higher request rate than other baselines while maintaining low per token latency. And when we bound the production latency to 100 milliseconds, uh, we are basically achieves 6 to 13x higher throughput than a baseline uh, called a fast transformer, and 1.7x to 2x higher throughput than Ocker. So basically, this fast transformer is a, a library uh, developed by the official NVIDIA, and it was a serving library prior to um, VLM. And also, uh, when we evaluate this, um, we are against another uh, very latest and stable their art um, libraries called uh, DGI, which is released by Hugging Face. We observe that uh, uh, there is a 3.5 higher throughput compared to DGI. Yeah, DGI stands for text generation and inference engine. Okay, uh, with that, I want to kind of conclude my talk. Uh, in conclusion, uh, VLM improves um, uh, the memory efficiency of VLM serving by 2.5 to 5x um, by minimizing the memory fragmentation and the enabling sharing. And this leads to a 1.7 to 4x um, higher service throughput compared to state of the art systems. And VLM is also more effective for large models, uh, long sequences, and uh, complex sampling algorithms, uh, which makes it a very, very future proof. And uh, VLM is used to uh, support the Chapel Arena project that I mentioned in my first part of the talk, and it enable us to serve like a 25 plus model in just a few, uh, like a dozen of uh, 800 GPUs, and this, but we can still keep a uh, low latency and uh, high throughput. Okay, I want to summarize my talk, and uh, basically in this talk, I talk about uh, um, how we uh, obtain the Wikuna model uh, in a side project and how we found that the Wakuna model is so hard to evaluate, and we started exploring different ways of evaluating chatbots, including using the strongest LM as a judge, and also uh, including um, how to uh, efficiently connect uh, human votes using the chatbot arena project, and uh, how we can, uh, and then I move the topic to uh, serving, that is how we can enable this chatbot arena project, how we can serve many, many LMs in a limited number of choices, and I started um, talk about uh, uh, the VRM project, which is the system technique behind Chapel Arena. Yeah, and thanks for listening.